know what we're going to do with some of you guys. There's too, too many tall people in here. I just don't know what Martin's going to do if you guys keep getting taller and taller and taller. It was bad enough when it was just me. Well, here we are, and the title of this message tonight is, I've Got Confidence. Like we sang about a minute ago, we are in Philippians chapter 1. Good to see so many people, and I really want to thank you for keeping Martin and I employed. If it wasn't for people that didn't have a place to live, we wouldn't have a job, so we're very grateful. Keep up the good work. <laughs> if you ever decide that you don't like us and you want to get even with us, and it's real simple, what to do is get a job, get your own place to live, and move out of here. It'll hurt us. We'll have to take half a baby aspirin to get to sleep at night. Chapter 1 of Philippians, I've got confidence. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. <coughs> Being confident of this very thing that he, God, which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, even as it is, it is meet for me to think of you all because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you, all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense or without sin till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. We'll just look at those 11 verses tonight. Let's go back to verse 1, point number 1, hello. That is point number one. Hello? Hello. <laughs> I did that Sunday morning and people looked up and said, what? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful. Paul writes this letter, first of all, to the people at Philippi. He calls them saints. That word kind of bothers some people. All it simply means is Christians, those that are set apart because of the grace of God that's been bestowed upon them. We are all saints. Uh, we grew up Catholic and we had little statues. Then I found out that wasn't what God had in mind. The word saint is the same word or comes from the same root word we get our word sanctified from. So you could call me Saint June. Don't do it in public though. I'm not going to start calling my wife Saint Nancy anytime soon. But technically that's true. We are saints. But that's just regular people. I was watching Bill Cosby, St. Bill Cosby is my favorite hero. And on the very first episode, I've watched the series over and over and over, the very first episode, he was having trouble with Theo. Theo was getting bad grades and he wasn't going to school like he was supposed to. And anyway, Bill got hot and he was talking to him. He says, well, what's gonna happen to you? Don't you wanna go to college? Don't you wanna get a good job? And Theo says, I just wanna be regular people. <laughs> regular people. <laughs> Well, that's what saints are. We are regular people, just the, the masses of the church, the Christians. And when I say Christians, I don't mean everybody that calls themselves a Christian or every church. I'm talking about people who really know Christ. Uh, every denomination, I've preached to nine of them in my lifetime so far, and in every denomination I've found some Christians, and i found a lot of people that were not Christians. And it's really kind of sad. i found a lot of preachers that are not Christians. You don't have to be a Christian to be a preacher. All you got to do is read this book and stick with it, kind of, sort of. Of course, a lot of them don't even do that. 
They make stuff up. And then he says, and the bishops and the deacons, they're kind of special. Now, in the Baptist church where I was ordained, we don't have bishops, but in the Methodist church, Episcopal church, uh, you know, the uh, Catholic church, they have bishops, you know. You can use that word if you want to. We don't use it. We don't like titles very much. We have deacons, but the deacons don't even know what that means. The word deacon means servant. Don't tell them, they'll get upset. Because they think deacon means boss. They want to run the show. And really, the deacon is supposed to be out there ministering to people, meeting their needs, and then bringing the things that are too hard for him to the pastor. And if the church functioned that way properly, you could have a really great church. But most of them don't, because the deacons don't do nothing except uh, get a title and vote on things. You know, in the early church, they didn't vote on anything. That's one reason I like being here at Godtell for 40 years now, because nobody gets to vote. I mean, you can't get rid of me. I'll be here after you're gone. There's been people who tried to get rid of me. Our board of directors didn't want to get I offered to give them my job. They wouldn't take it. Martin didn't want it. I said, Martin, you can have my job. He didn't want my job. Of course, Martin's got a good boss because I don't ever tell him nothing. <laughs> Martin likes it that way, I can tell. <laughs> as long as he stays in the parameters that we have, as long as I stay in those parameters, nobody tells us anything, and that's good. It's kind of a neat place to be. In verse 2, he talks about grace. Grace is G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid for everything that you're supposed to have, victory, being triumphant in your life, peace in your heart, contentment, joy, all those things. Christ paid for those, and when you become a Christian, they belong to you. Now, I'm going to deal with this issue in just a moment, but I want to say right here, if you are one of those people who believes that you can lose your salvation, you will never have peace in your heart because you'll always be worried about that one thing you might do right before you die and end up in hell. Now, folks, Jesus paid the penalty for your sin long before you got here. And you need to understand the peace that he is giving us is the quality of peace that allows us to trust him. You are not going to ever be perfect until you're dead. And that's only if you get into heaven. If you go to hell, you'll still be imperfect. This peace comes from God the Father and, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But you need to understand what I'm talking about. People who, and there are churches where people are trying to earn their salvation, they're trying to work their way. Salvation is totally of God. It has nothing to do with you except for the choice you make to trust Him. But if you really trust Him, if Jesus really comes into your heart, He will change you. He won't let you get away with nothing. These people that just do any old thing they want to, I know right away they don't know Jesus. He says, I thank God when I thank you. The reason he says that is because these are people that he had originally planted the seeds of salvation, led them to the Lord. He was the author of their church. He started it. And he was feeling such great joy because these people here at Philippi were actually doing what they were supposed to do. That's kind of nice once in a while. That's why I've been so excited about Jonathan Moore. And some of you don't know Jonathan Moore. He stayed here for a while. He was, he was here and he was crazy. He was a Burke Center patient on medication. And when we finally got him out of here, he was running down the street naked. And five police officers had to bring him down. He only weighs 130 pounds. One, of them got his one police officer got his face all messed up. They tasered him twice and couldn't stop him because of those drugs. Well, after he got out of jail, I took him up to the Nacogdoches Mission. We had discussions. He decided he did not want to be on medication anymore. I encouraged him to get off of every medication he had. He got off those medications. After about two months up there, he became a Christian. I had the privilege of baptizing him. And then, man, this guy got on fire for Jesus. He just fell in love with Jesus. And this guy would go up and down the street. He didn't want to talk to nobody about anything but Jesus. And he had ways of drawing attention to himself at his job so people would come and ask him questions. It was always turned back around about Jesus. And he would tell people, he'd say, man, God tell saved my life. Well, that's not true. We didn't save his life. Jesus saved his life. We just introduced him to, to Christ. Well, a few weeks ago, he called me up. Of course, you know, this has been now a year and a half. 
And uh, he's been walking with the Lord, doing great, got a job, got an apartment, doing really good. And he called me up and he says, Brother June, he says, God has told me to go to Baltimore. This is back when they're having all those riots and everything. And I said, Jonathan, are you sure? He said, I'm positive. So he told his boss he was going to Baltimore and they liked him. They said, you can have your job back whenever you come back. And he found somebody to take over the lease on his apartment. And I told him, I said, Jonathan, you might get shot tomorrow, but if God told you to go, then go. And he went. And he's been up there now for about, what, four weeks, four or five weeks. And uh, he's been witnessing people. He used to have a job. You've seen the signs like over here at Liberty Tax Office. They've got somebody standing out there wearing that Liberty suit and dangling mm -hmm. that sign. And some of the restaurants do that. Well, Jonathan had a job like that at Bull Burritos in Nacogdoches. And um, he was, he would put this Christian music in his head and dance up and down the street with his sign. Uh, he ended up on YouTube and people handing him money. And I mean, it was, just, it was crazy what was going on. But uh, anyway, after he left there and went to Baltimore, he went and had himself a sign made up about Jesus. And this is what he does. He goes up and down in the worst part of town. He just dancing with the, to the music in his headphones and, and waving that sign. And people think he's a nut, so they come up and talk to him. And then he gets to tell them about Jesus. They say, this is how the conversation starts. Why are you always so happy? Every time we see you, you got a smile on your face. And then he starts telling them how Jesus changed his life what he was like before and I I get excited about him just like Paul was excited about these people and I get excited and I say oh God we could have a few more Jonathans you know just a few more and it really reminded me somewhat of myself when I first came to East Texas after I got saved after I became a Christian because I used to go up and down the streets preaching to everybody anybody who stopped five seconds we we talked to them hand out gospel tracts just you know we enjoyed doing that of course now I don't have to because God brings you to me God knew I'd get old and couldn't dance up and down the street anymore so puts us over here and that's good point number two now is always He says, I'm always praying and making requests for you in my prayers with joy. Why? Because, see, right things bring joy. And if you remember the last chapter of Ephesians where we left off last week, Paul was praying for things and then he even asked for prayer for himself. But the prayers were for boldness so that he could go out and preach as he ought to. He didn't pray for junk, toys, stuff. You see, prayer is supposed to change you. Now, there's a... I see them all the time, bumper stickers on cars that say, prayer changes things. That is a lie. It's always been a lie. There's nothing wrong with the things in the world. The problem isn't the things, the problem is us and our misuse of things. Everything God made, God said it was good. But then you and I come along and we find this chemical over here, and we find this one over here, and then we get to playing around and find out if we put them two together, we could go bazonkers. It wasn't God's fault. We're misusing. We're the ones that discovered how to make really strong alcohol and beer and all this stuff. You know, we're the ones that did that. And we misuse it. Originally, God had that stuff for medicinal purposes. It even says so in the Bible. It says, give strong drink to him that's about to perish. That's to ease his pain as he's dying. Oh, we don't do that. We're 18 wanting to get stoned. You know? Well, that's not God's fault. We misuse what God has made for us. And so Paul in his prayers was praying for right things, that those people were asking for right things, and that brings great joy in your life, and the wrong things will destroy you. That's why you should never, ever, ever pray for a bunch of junk. You might get it. And you might not want it after you got it. And you might not be able to get rid of it. That's why one of the worst prayers you can ever pray, and I've heard people pray this, God, give me what I deserve. <laughs> Do you know what we all deserve? Hell. We all deserve to be in hell. Every one of us is a sinner. Everyone's got a wicked heart. And we deserve to be in hell. That's what we deserve. So I never ask God to give me what I deserve. I say, God, please give me mercy. I'm glad I don't have the wife I deserve. I already know what she'd be like. She'd be six foot five, weigh 245, and have a rolling pin about that big to keep me in line. I'm glad God didn't do that. 
We'd go broke on combat boots. I don't have the job I deserve. If I got the job I deserve, I'd be cleaning the walls in a sewer. That's what I deserve. I don't want what I deserve. I don't want anything I deserve. I want mercy. I want grace. That's what I want. <clears throat> but some people are so ignorant. Oh, Brother June, I'm just praying God will give me what I deserve. Don't do that. The other thing he says we enjoy is fellowship. It's hard to have, if you're a Christian, if you're real, a real Christian, it's hard to have fellowship with anybody that's not a real Christian. You don't have anything in common. What do you talk about? Football? I can't stand sports. Uh, Royce, who runs our Nacogdoches mission, he's a fine guy, and Mike, and some of the other guys that work for me. But every time I come in here when it's sports season, that's all they ever talk about. I just, I, and I'm over there going, you know, man, if I was sitting in the bleachers of a football game with a rifle, I couldn't wait for one of those Hail Mary passes so I could see if I could shoot that ball. <laughs> Basketball? I figured that game out a long time ago. You want to end the game quick? Sew up the nets. First one puts one in. Game over. We could all go home. And golf? That's got to be the dumbest game ever invented by man. You take this perfectly wonderful, beautiful little white ball that ain't never done you any harm. And you put it on the ground on a little stick, and then you smack it as hard as you can. Well, that's not bad enough. Then you go out and look for it. I guess you go out and look for it to apologize to the ball for smacking it. But you don't. You go out and smack it again. <clears throat> I can't see any point to any of this stuff. Somebody asked me, a while back, a few weeks ago. Um, have you ever played a round of golf? I said, no. I said, play a little miniature golf with my kids when they were little, but that's all. I said, but you know what? You guys keep bugging me because they ask me occasionally if I've ever played golf because they're always talking about golf. And I told Martin, I said, you know, Martin, we ought to go out and just play one 18 holes of golf. Just one time. Just so when people ask me, I say, yeah, we tried that. We didn't like it. I don't even know what kind of gun you're supposed to use when you shoot a golf anyway. Some of you hadn't watched the Beverly Hillbillies, I can tell. <clears throat> the fellowship among Christians is really, really good. It doesn't mean you don't talk about anything else. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying your, your priorities are centered around the things of Christ. Point number three, a good work. God says through Paul in verse 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, that's salvation. When Christ came into your heart, he will complete or finish that work until he comes back. Now, folks, I want to give you some scripture. I hope you write these down. I hope you look them up. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Christ. He does not predestinate who gets saved, but he predestinates what you're going to look like once you've accepted Christ. Now, if you're one of those people that thinks that we're all children of God, you need to go check out somewhere and maybe put your head in a hole because that ain't true. The only thing we are is people. We're children of people. Most of you are. Every one of you, whether you knew your parents or didn't know your parents, whatever, somewhere you had a mommy and a daddy. It takes two to tango. And you are, have come from a long line of people. Of course, there's always someone says, no, I didn't. I said, you're not from here? No, I'm not from here. Where are you from? Mars. Well, when I find a person like that, I like to get some help. We need to put them on the ground and check for a belly button. Because when I was little, I was told that Martians didn't have belly buttons. So, <laughs> so I don't know if that's true or not. But, <laughs> but there are people that say stupid things like that. We are being in the process of time changed, conformed to the image of Christ. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, until one day we stand before God and we will be perfect then. Now, there's some people that believe they can lose their salvation. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, Brother June, I used to be saved. I said, what? 
He said, oh, yeah, I used to be saved. He said, I said, how long were you saved? He said, two years. Two years. That's interesting. I said, then you didn't get eternal life, did you? He said, what? I said, well, you told me you were saved for only two years. Then you didn't get eternal life. I said, you only got two-year life. And I guess the warranty ran out. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall have what? Everlasting, everlasting life. Oh, everlasting. That means it has no beginning, it has no end, and there's no breaks in the middle, right? That's what everlasting is. That's the only kind of life God ever gives. It's called eternal life, everlasting life. He doesn't give two-year life, ten-year life, twenty-year life. He only gives eternal life. 1 Timothy chapter 6. In God alone dwells immortality. He's the only one that's immortal. We're not. So what God does when we come to him and trust Jesus for our salvation, he gives us his own life. We will never be God. If you want to be a God, you've got to join the Mormon church. They ain't going to make it, but they, they're happy thinking it, you know. He gives us a quality of life that only he possesses. In John 3.36, it says, if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? The wrath of God abides on you. And then in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, he tells us why we can't lose our salvation. Anybody, everybody in here was born, right? Y'all were born. None of you were hatched. None of you grew up in a cabbage patch or anything like that. You're all born, right? Anybody ever see anybody get unborn? You've seen people die, but did anybody ever get unborn? Well, you see, when you become a Christian, you're born by the Spirit of God spiritually into the family of God, and you will die. And if you're smart, you'll be dying a lot to self right now. But you can't get unborn spiritually any more than you can get unborn physically. And so in Hebrews chapter 6, it tells you why you can't lose your salvation. I was having a discussion with the then, it was some years ago, pastor of Glad Tidings Assembly of God Church, they believe you can lose your salvation. And he was telling me, oh yeah, he says, I know people that were saved and got lost. I said, whoa, wait a minute, stop. You don't know if anybody else is saved. I don't know if anybody else in here is saved because I can't see your heart. You could be fooling me. My wife, I've been living with her 42 years. I really believe she's saved, you know, because I see the fruit in her life. But I can't see her heart. And by and large, I don't want to see your hearts. Because our hearts are really wicked. Whether you like it or not, this is the truth. Everybody in this room is capable of any sin or crime you can think of. We're all capable. I was reading about the tortures of ISIS and how they were beheading people and all this kind of stuff in the Islamic movement. And I thought, oh, that's just horrible, you know, some of the things they were doing. Then I was reading about the Armenian ge genocide of 1915. And, some, and I can't even repeat some of the things they did to people who were so horrendous. But one of the things they did to the Christians was they nailed horseshoes to their feet. Can you imagine that? I mean, I hurt just thinking about it. You know, they, they tortured people. They would cut off their arms and walk, make them walk around and, until they bled to death. You know, stuff like that. It's crazy stuff. After I was reading this stuff, I woke up in the middle of the night one night, and in my mind, I'd thought up a new torture. And I said, Lord, where did that come from? The Lord said, it's already there. It's in your heart. See, my heart's just as wicked as their heart. The only difference is they're doing it, and I choose not to. I'm just as capable of doing anything they're doing. But I, we were brought up a little bit different in this country. We have different sensibilities. And so that stuff kind of gets pushed down. Some people more than others. There are people in this country that torture people. Well, he tells you in Hebrews why you can't lose your salvation. Because if you could lose it, you could never get it back. You can't be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost like some of these churches preach. Because in order to get saved after you were saved and then got lost, Jesus would have to die again for you, and he's not going to do it. He paid the price once for all. That's it. He's not going to do it. You ought to read those verses sometime very carefully. 
Paul believed those people were saved and that they had been partakers of the same grace, that's verse 7, that he was a partaker of. Because you see, the same grace that saved Paul, the same grace that saved Billy Graham, is the same grace that saves me or you. There's no different grace for different people. It's the same. And it's infinite. He has enough grace to save everybody. John 3.16 is enough Bible to save the whole world. But most people aren't going to listen to it because people want to do what they want to do. So what do we have? We have people in the world today that teach things in schools that they shouldn't because they don't want to let God in the school. So we kick God out of the school and tell the little kids, you can't pray in here. We don't, don't you tell them kids they can pray. We might warp their personalities or something. But we can teach them a lie that they came from a single cell organism that evolved in a piece of slime pond. We can tell them that. None of it makes any sense. By the way, you need to understand, I've written two books on creation and evolution, and I want you to understand that in my research, I found out that there is absolutely no proof for evolution. None, anywhere. They made it up. And the people that made it up even know they made it up. And even the scientists, recently there was a, well, I say recently, it's been a couple of years now, they had a meeting of scientists, 2,000 scientists, all PhDs, top men in their fields. The moderator stood up, and I mentioned this once before, but I'll mention it again. He stood up and he said, I want somebody, anybody in this audience to stand up and tell us one thing that we absolutely know for sure about evolution. And there was dead silence. And finally, one man raised his hand. They passed him the microphone. And he said, I know one thing absolutely that's true about evolution. We should not teach it in high school. Another man said, very famous, it was Huxley, I believe it was, Darwin's bulldog. He said, we do not, no, it wasn't Huxley, it was somebody. But anyway, it was one of those top guys. He said, the reason we believe in evolution, or we leapt at it, as he said, is because to believe in God interferes with our sexual mores. In case you don't know what that means, it means if we believe in God, we're accountable to God, we can't do what we want to do, so we'll just say God doesn't exist. That way we can do what we want to do. There's nobody to answer to. I feel sorry for them kind of people on Judgment Day when they go, oops. You didn't know this, but I'm going to tell you, there is an eternal word one word that is eternal that lasts all through eternity it's the word oops and there are going to be a lot of people saying that when they see God who they didn't think exists oops God says you're going to hell oops I mean what would you say it's going to be kind of hard to argue with God isn't it yes. yeah so Paul believed they were saved by that same grace and folks, I want you to know that there, there is no proof in the fossil record that evolution ever occurred. There's all kinds of weird theories. Hoyle came up, he's a great British astronomer with uh, directed panspermia. This has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Directed panspermia. That means that life was seeded on Earth by aliens. You chuckle, but you know there's PhDs out there who believe it. They believe that aliens came down here a long time ago and planted life on Earth. Well, that doesn't solve the problem. All that does is push it back. Where'd they come from? See, they didn't think that through. And if you say another race planted them, well, where'd they come from? You, you have the same problem. Because there's only two ways you could get here. Either you evolved from that slime in the pond, or God made you. There's no other way to get here. It's only two ways. Then there's things like Stephen Jay Gould came up with, punctuated equilibrium. I always like that one the best because, see, in the fossil record, what you find is stasis. That means everything stays the same. There's no, there's no proof that anything ever evolved into anything else. But Gould solved the problem this way. A dinosaur laid an egg. Out popped a dinosaur. Next generation, a dinosaur laid an egg and out popped a dinosaur. Next generation, a dinosaur lays an egg, out pops a dinosaur. Next generation, a dinosaur lays an egg, out pops a bird. He, he's a paleontologist from Harvard or something like that. He went to Harvard, I know that. He, he's a scientist, a you know, great man of science. Uh, and he comes up with that? Where's the proof of it? 
Well, see, that's the nice thing about his theory. You don't have to have any proof. Because it was a dinosaur egg, but a bird came out. The only problem with that is there are birds that are known, like Archaeopteryx, Proto-Avis from Texas, that were here before the dinosaurs went extinct, before any dinosaurs had time to evolve, before some of the dinosaurs even came, you know. Some people say, oh, but that was, a, that was not really a bird. It must have been a dinosaur. Why? Had teeth. There's a birds, there are birds alive today that have teeth. Don't ever get bit by one. You'll know it. There's a lot of strange animals in the world. My wife and I are fond of looking at National Geographic's about the animals. Some of the strangest creatures live on this planet you've ever seen. I'm glad they don't live here. <laughs> Point number four. Long play LP. Do you all remember LP records? 33 and a third long playing records. By the way, in case you're interested, my very first album back in the early 1980 was on vinyl. It was a, a, a record, you know. I still have about 450 of them if anybody wants to buy one cheap. All you got to do is have your very big boom box with a record player on it. God knows how I longed. That means he was desperate for those people to be in Christ. I was watching Star Trek one day. It was the one where the Klingons wanted to kill their chancellor, and so they got underneath the Enterprise, made it look like Enterprise fired on their ship, and uh, Kirk and McCoy beamed over, and McCoy's trying to save the chancellor's life. Chancellor dies, and they put Kirk and McCoy on trial, and they blame them for killing the chancellor, and McCoy says, I wanted him to live. I was desperate for him to live. That's what Paul's saying here. He says, I was desperate for these people to be saved. I don't know that I've ever been desperate for anybody to be saved. I was desperate when I got saved. Well, I was real desperate. But for anybody else, I don't know. I pray that your love will grow in two things, knowledge and judgment. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed from la for lack of knowledge. God does not claim a... a, a, a Place, that's the word I'm looking for. God does not place a premium on ignorance. There's certain things you have to know. First, you have to know you're a sinner. That's not too hard. You need to know that Jesus can save you if you'll let him. And then you got to let him. That's what faith is. you got to trust him. And the, the proof is always in the pudding. When you come to Christ, he changes your life. If there's no change, and I can't understand some of these people that call themselves Christians and then they want to live in homosexuality. That's just like a murderer saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to keep murdering. Or a drunk saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to keep on being a drunk. That's, that's not possible. Jesus will not allow that. He will change your life and make you what you ought to be. And if you don't want to cooperate with him and let him do that, it's because probably you don't know him. There's a lot of people that are going to say, Lord, Lord, Matthew chapter 7. Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We preached in your name. We did all this stuff. We even went down and worked to God tell you know. Doesn't matter. Jesus is going to look at those people and say, I don't know you, you sinners. Get away from me. <clears throat> if you know Christ, he is changing your life. It may not be as fast as somebody else, like Jonathan. Boy, we saw such a change in him from the time he was running naked in the street to the time he left to go to Baltimore. I mean, you'd never believe it was the same person. God changed him. He didn't do it. God did it. I didn't change me. I got an aunt that says, oh, June, we're so proud of you for pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. I said, Katie, I didn't do it. Jesus did it. I let Jesus in. He changed me. She has a problem with that. She's going to die. She's old. And she's an atheist. She just, my mother was an atheist. Before she died, she died an atheist. That whole side of the family is like that. And judgment means where to place your love and how to use it. You see, I'm supposed to love you even if I don't like you. I don't like you. That makes it easy. I just got to love you. That means I got to treat you right. doesn't mean I got to feel anything for you. I just got to treat you like I'm supposed to. It's all about choices. That's what really true love is. I get so irritated with these people. Their love's based on emotions and feelings and what happens. Their marriage doesn't last six months. Nancy and I have been married for 42 years, not because of emotion, but because we both love the Lord and we obey Him. And as we obey Him, then He gives us a really good relationship, and now I won't even trade her for two mules and 40 acres. 
There was a time I might have, but not now. I'm going to keep her. I, I, have, I like to have fun. I sometimes look at my wife and say, honey, would you marry me again? Honey, you're doing so good, I think I'll keep you for at least another three months. <laughs> To know what is the right thing and the wrong things to do with that love. A lot of people misplace it. You can help people and hurt people at the same time. You see, God said to love our neighbors, we love ourselves. And we've got people on one side of the issue that love too much. And they're doing things that are helping you when they need to let you hit bottom. And then we got on the other side, we got this other group over here that doesn't do nothing. There's a balance. And finding that balance is what's important. Martin, you need to issue clocks to some of these people. They keep looking at that clock. Maybe if they had their own, they wouldn't have to turn around, you know. <laughs> and he says to be sincere. And what he's talking about there is to be sincere with no sin. You can be sincere and be wrong. There's a lot of religions in the world today. They've got very sincere people. People who strap dynamite on their bodies, go into a shopping mall, and blow themselves up are very sincere. But they're also wrong. So he says, with no sin. So that means unbelief in Christ. Somebody said to me one time, Brother June, I, I wish I could believe like you, but I can't. I said, no, sir. It's not that you can't. It's that you won't. Folks, if I can believe what I'm telling you right here, anybody can believe it. It's a choice. When I came to know Christ in jail in 1971, I made a choice. And as I read the Word of God, I found out that my choice was well placed. And it was easier and easier to believe. But it started with a choice. I chose to believe. Somebody told Josh McDowell one day, they said, you Christians are all alike. You're all brainwashed. And Josh said, you're right. But at least we choose who watches, washes our brains. <laughs> we do. And lastly, he ends up by saying, filled with righteousness. That means right doing. Work done by Jesus in you. And this work of Christ in you will show God's glory and the praise of God. Not our praise, the praise of God. My great desire in life is to get out of here and to look at the Lord and have him say to me, well done. Now you can get to heaven with a full reward and hear him say, well done. If you're really a Christian, you can get to heaven with no reward and he'll say, well, you made it, barely, but you got here. Getting there is better than not. But I really personally would like to get there and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So I try to obey him. I like to make my wife happy too. And if I make the Lord happy, I usually end up making her happy. And then she'll say to me one day, and she says it sometimes, well done. You did a good job. And sometimes when she says that, I feel like a six-year-old. Because <laughs> we do that to six-year-olds. Good job. <laughs> What'd they do? They made it to the bathroom without tinkling in their pants. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> they ate all their peas. Good job. Sometimes I feel like that, you know. But that's okay. I'd rather hear that than the other. If you are not a Christian, you need to understand you have got this lifetime to get this thing straightened out and to get into heaven. You need to call upon the name of the Lord while he is able to be found by you. Even though he's not lost, you are. And if you're a Christian... You need to understand that God wants to change you. And if you're really a Christian, he's going to. He's going to finish this work he starts. But you can get there a lot quicker if you'll cooperate. And you can get there standing on your feet instead of get drug in. You will get in if you're really a Christian. And the only one that can answer that question is you. Father, we thank you for loving each one of us. We thank you for each one in this room. And we pray, Father, that they're listening with a spiritual ear, with their souls, and that they'll allow you to have your way in their lives. I know there's some here that claim to be Christians, and yet they won't even give up their cigarettes for you. 
And that amazes me. Because if they really love you, they'll be able to at least do that. And I run into others who say they love you, but they won't quit drinking when your word tells us not to be drunks. I run into other people who tell me they were Christians, they're living in adultery. I run into people with bad attitudes, but they say they're Christians. And I'm not talking about just a bad attitude now and then. We all get that. Some people just seem to have one all the time. We run into people that say they're Christians, but they want to live the gay lifestyle when your word says it's an abomination. It's amazing to me. Thieves, liars, and cheats. And yet, many of those people call themselves Christians. I wish that all the people that really weren't Christians would quit calling themselves Christians. They're not helping anybody. And they're not fooling you, that's for sure. They can fool me for a while, but they can't fool you at all. We thank you for the folks that help out around here. We're very grateful that they do that. Because it's not something that they do to be thanked for. There's no thanks in sweeping the floor or doing the dishes. But they're all things that need to be done so we can exist here. And of course, we thank you for our staff. It's a hard job. Sometimes we feel like just throwing our hands up in the air and walking away and never coming back. But because we know what you want us to do, we keep coming back. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the salvation that Christ provided by paying the penalty for our sins on the cross and for raising from the dead. We thank you that he promised to return and we're looking forward to that event. We thank you for meeting our needs. We're so grateful that all three of the missions you've entrusted us with, nobody had to go hungry today. Doesn't seem like a very big thing. We take it for granted because we have so much food being donated. But I think back and remember the times when we didn't and we just barely got by. We're so grateful that we have so much now. Bless your word. Bless each one of these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.